Well, good morning to you. It's 9.30. We're ready to, to start our Bible study this morning on a, a nice wet day here. Uh, as people are coming, I, I've heard that people, preachers and teachers, are less likely to, to reference local events now that video is a thing. Uh, that, you know, it, it's rainy for us, but, you know, maybe people watching on YouTube don't even know it's rainy. Or if you, there's a, there's always a thing you could always, you know, mention sports games and results that is relevant to your audience, but then you don't, you don't know. Maybe people don't even care about those things uh, if they're on video. Uh, so it's a new challenge for us. Uh, but I expect people are going to be trickling in uh, as we get started this morning, uh, and hopefully uh, everybody is safe in the weather out there this morning. Uh, this morning our topic is uh, covering two letters of the Apostle Paul. Uh, we're, we're nearing the end of what we have to work with with the Apostle Paul. We have uh, these two letters, 1 Timothy and Titus, uh, and we have 2 Timothy. Uh, we'll talk about that one next week. Uh, we'll talk about anything we can try to figure out about the end of Paul's life. Uh, and then we'll, I think we'll just kind of do a, a summary, uh, go through, hit the high points from this study. It's, it's been going on for over five months, so we've got actually a, a good bit to summarize. Um, I don't imagine a lot, of you, a lot of us have been here for every single one of these. Uh, so we'll just spend this week and maybe two more weeks uh, to, to wrap up this study. Last week, uh, we were studying the book of Philippians. Uh, the, the big message there uh, is that Paul is in prison, uh, and the church in Philippi sends this church member, we don't know anything else about him, uh, his name is Epaphroditus, uh, they send him off probably to Rome, where Paul is in prison, uh, with some financial support. You know, being a prisoner in a Roman prison, you don't necessarily uh, get all your, uh, the amenities uh, that even we expect for prisons today. Uh, you're, you're expected to have friends and family support you. Well, while he's there, Epaphroditus gets sick, uh, so sick that he, he almost dies. And you can imagine, the, you know, the church in Philippi is concerned. They haven't heard anything from this guy. They sent him with a lot of money, uh, and now they don't know, did, did he take the money? Uh, did something happen to him? Uh, so Paul, once Epaphroditus recovers, uh, sends a letter back to Philippi with Epaphroditus uh, and to, to cover some points. First, he, he wants to, to thank them for their financial gift. Uh, and he does that uh, in a couple places. He, he wants to explain what happened to Epaphroditus. Nothing, uh, there's no, uh, nothing inappropriate. Just, it was a serious thing. He got sick, uh, but he has been so concerned about you, uh, and now he's better again. Uh, but Paul also takes this opportunity to, to teach about following Jesus' ex example of submission and suffering. Uh, so here he, he has what appears to be a, a poem. Maybe he wrote it. Maybe he's including it from somewhere else. Uh, talking about how Jesus, who, who is equal with God, who was God, uh, and yet he, he gives that up. Uh, he lowers himself as a human. Uh, he lowers himself to this humiliating death. Uh, and yet, uh, after this death, God raises him back up to the, the, the position of honor. Uh, where once again everyone recognizes that Jesus is God. Uh, and so he, he uses that, and then he, he reflects on his own story about how he was this, this Jew who was born uh, with everything you could want, uh, with this, this perfect position in life. Uh, and yet he gave that up. Uh, he, he considers it worthless now that he has uh, come to know Christ. Uh, and he's... He's hoping that he, he, you know, his own sufferings are you know, sharing the sufferings of Jesus. Just as Jesus suffered, uh, he is doing the same thing. Uh, and just as Jesus is, is raised from the dead, he says, you know, perhaps I too uh, could share in his resurrection. Uh, so we see the example of Jesus. We see the example of Paul. And the message for the Philippians, the message for us is clear, is here are the examples to follow of giving up what we have, uh, even if that means suffering, in order to follow Jesus. Uh, so that's the, the basics of Philippians. Uh, let's get into our, 
letters today. Uh, so 1 Timothy, uh, it appears that Timothy is in the city of Ephesus, uh, and Titus is on the island of Crete. Uh, we don't know what, I don't know what city he may have been in. And it appears that Paul had been in Rome, uh, but now he is free to move again as we kind of read between the lines of these letters. So uh, maybe our first question, uh, and maybe it's, a, maybe it's a question you've never thought to ask, is did Paul really write these letters? Uh, may seem surprising because it, these have Paul's name on them. Uh, they say they are from Paul. Uh, but actually, if you, if you, know, if you get into the, the scholarship of uh, these letters, you find lots of people don't think these were written by Paul. Uh, it's, it's, not, it's really been maybe the consensus view of the last hundred years is that uh, these are not written by Paul, but they're also not exactly a forgery. Uh, they're, they're what they call pseudepigrapha. Uh, it's someone who is not trying to deceive. They're, they're really trying to, to get into the, the, the persona of Paul and write as though they are Paul. Some later person who admires Paul uh, and wants to, to give some kind of teaching like Paul would have given. Uh, and we see lots of examples of this outside of Scripture, of this pseudepigrapha. Uh, well, actually, you look at the letters, and actually you find there's uh, several books where people say, well, I don't know if, if Paul actually wrote this. It has his name on it. Uh, but uh, we, we have several that are undisputed, which is not, I mean, some people think Paul didn't write any of them. I, I don't know how you come to that conclusion. Uh, but generally, people accept Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. And then there's this other batch that various scholars uh, want to argue are not from Paul, despite saying they're from Paul. Uh, so we have Ephesians and Colossians. We didn't, we didn't talk about this when we got uh, to those books. Uh, but people say, well, you know, this, these seem very different from the other books of Paul, uh, we, which I think we pointed out in our class. He's, he's talking about this cosmic view of the, the work of Jesus. Uh, and they're, they're similar to each other, but you know, a little bit different than the other books. I, I think if you're willing to put in Philemon, I think you see there's lots of, of subtle but clear connections between Philemon and Colossians. Uh, the, the mention of Onesimus, the, the shared greetings, that I think if you put in Philemon, I think you should put in Colossians too. And once you put in Colossians, then all of a sudden uh, Ephesians isn't that different from the undisputed corpus. Uh, it's a lot like Colossians, which we've already uh, put in. Uh, so then you could put Ephesians in as well. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm pretty happy to, to put Ephesians and Colossians as being written by Paul like they say. Now, 2 Thessalonians, uh, the problem people have is actually it's too similar to 1 Thessalonians, which you just can't win here if Ephesians and Colossians are too different, so they must have been written by someone else. Well, 2 Thessalonians is too similar, uh, so it must have been written by someone else. Uh, once again, I, I don't have a problem with 2 Thessalonians being similar. I think they're just they're written at the same time or you know, similar time in quick uh, sequence, uh, and so they're addressing a lot of the same issues, uh, and it, so it makes sense, I think, that these are similar to each other. Well, that leaves us with these last three letters, uh, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Well, well, let's maybe go through the evidence that uh, people present to say they don't think these were written by Paul. Uh, so, number one, uh, the travel mentioned in First Timothy and Titus doesn't fit with the travel described in Acts. Now, we, we see in the other letters, like Romans talks about he, he was going to Jerusalem uh, and then wants to go to Rome. We, we see how that fits in with the, the narrative of Acts. Uh, but you read through these letters. Uh, for, in Titus, he talks about uh, leaving Titus at Crete, so some visit to the island of Crete. Uh, the only time we have that in Acts is Paul, on the, as a prisoner, traveling to Rome. Uh, no, no reference to Titus there. Uh, so that doesn't... Uh, have any obvious tie-in to Acts. Uh, 
Uh, he tells Titus you know, to come to him at Nicopolis for the winter. No, no mention of that in Acts. Uh, tells Timothy uh, to go to Ephesus when they're, when they're in Macedonia. You know, he passes through Macedonia a few times and passes through Ephesus a couple times, but there's no mention of this uh, sort of travel plans of sending Timothy one direction while he stays in Macedonia. Uh, so, I, I, in 2 Timothy, there's all sorts of stuff in 2 Timothy. People going to Thessalonica and Galatia, Titus going to Dalmatia, uh, you know, way into Eastern Europe, uh, Tychicus going to, to Ephesus, uh, Carpus at Troy. Like, all, all these things are, are not things that we find in the book of Acts. Uh, so, I do think this is true, that the travel described in 1 Timothy and Titus uh, isn't uh, corresponding to the stuff in Acts. Uh, but I don't actually have a problem with that either. Uh, if you remember, the, the book of Acts ends with Paul very much alive, uh, in prison, uh, but from the letters, hopeful, expectant that he's going to be released. Uh, and so uh, I think the view is he is, in fact, released from prison. Uh, and so he's still alive, he's still healthy. Uh, he continues to do traveling after he has written uh, the prison letters. And so this, we wouldn't expect this to match Acts. This all is taking place later in Paul's life. Uh, and so I, I think this is a, a true observation, uh, but it's unnecessary to, to come to the conclusion that then Paul didn't write these letters. Uh, number two, uh, people point out, you know, these church offices of elders and bishops and deacons, uh, they become more prominent as time goes on, especially into the second century and beyond. Uh, and, you, you know, in 1 Timothy and Titus, he's going to be talking about elders and deacons. Uh, and so, uh, it, I think, once again, we have something that is, is true here, but we don't actually uh, come to the, the same conclusion. Uh, if you read the New Testament, I think you actually find quite early on uh, references to elders. Uh, so if you were to read uh, Acts, this is you know, Paul and Barnabas' first journey. Uh, one thing they're doing is appointing elders in these churches. This is you know, 15 years prior uh, to when Paul would have written 1 Timothy and Titus. Uh, on the, the third journey, uh, the, there's a, a memorable scene there uh, where Paul sends for the, the Ephesian elders. Uh, he has this uh, goodbye speech to them, uh, mentions them as overseers and shepherds, all there. Uh, and in, in the, the book of Philippians, he's addressing it to the overseers and deacons of the church of Philippi. Once again, this is one of those undisputed uh, books of Paul. Uh, so I, I don't think uh, we necessarily have to say that these church offices are, are some later uh, invention. We, we see them pretty clearly in the New Testament. Uh, we do see that they change over time, uh, that, that this office of overseer or bishop starts to, to separate uh, from the, the, the office of elder, uh, whereas in the New Testament they seem synonymous. Uh, by the second century, they, they start to set up more of a hierarchy for it. Uh, so to say, it is true, elders and deacons are a part of this letter, but I think we find them uh, throughout the New Testament much earlier than this. It's not some sort of later... Uh, structural creation. Uh, so I, I don't really worry too much about this bit either. Uh, number three, uh, the heretic Marcion. Uh, we, we talked about him maybe the, ver the very first week, this guy named Marcion. He, he's a big fan of Paul. Uh, and he creates his own version of the New Testament uh, that has the Gospel of Luke and it has most of Paul's letters, but not these three, First and Second Timothy and Titus. The argument is, well, maybe he didn't, he didn't include those because they hadn't actually been written. Uh, they were written sometime later by somebody who wasn't Paul. Uh, well, I, I do think, um, you know, the whole problem with, with Marcy, and he, he's a heretic. Uh, he's kind of a nut job. And, and everybody kind of recognized this guy uh, his whole thing is throwing out books of the Bible that he doesn't like. Uh, and the church said, you, know, you can't pick and choose uh, your favorite books and throw out the ones you don't like. And so they, 
they basically kick him out of the church. Uh, so I don't really want to side with, with Marcion on this, the guy who uh, his whole thing is throwing books out of the Bible. So if he doesn't include some books that I think are genuine, uh, I'm not necessarily going to take that as very convincing. Uh, so I, I'm, it does, I think, uh, point to a point where the, the church really starts to think about, hey, you know, we, we really need to decide uh, and make it clear which books are part of Scripture. Uh, and Marcy enforces that issue uh, but he, he forces the church to respond, and, and they respond by including these letters and a whole bunch of other things that, that Marcion was willing to throw out. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm okay with this one as well. I think this doesn't give us uh, any evidence that Paul uh, did not write these letters. The last thing to mention, uh, number four, the style of, these, of, the, of writing in these letters is different than Paul's other letters. Uh, this really started in the, in the 20th century. People started doing these word studies and realizing you know, there's lots of, of unique words in these letters that Paul doesn't use other places. And some of Paul's favorite words in his other letters don't show up in these letters. Uh, and so there, there is, I think, a, a difference in style uh, with these three letters and the other letters of Paul. Now, the question is, is is a difference in style reason to say this is also a different author than the the one who is uh, attributed in the books? Well, what would be some reasons for these books being a different style? Uh, Well, they're they're saying uh, the different style is from this, because it's not written by Paul. It's someone who is an admirer of Paul, uh, but he just couldn't match Paul's style. which I, I don't know about this. Uh, you know, we, we mentioned this letter to Laodicea a couple weeks ago, uh, where if someone's trying to come up with a, an imitation, uh, the, the idea is to, to closely match what you're imitating. And so that letter just pulled together lots of little phrases from elsewhere in Paul, stuck them all together. Uh, but it, it's, it seems like an odd way to, to imitate by not copying the style. Uh, I think there's better reasons why uh, this ha- these letters have a different style. Uh, and I don't necessarily pick one of these, but uh, I think they're all more likely possibilities in this first one. Uh, so maybe uh, this letter was transcribed by a different amanuensis. Uh, there's a, a word for you. You can write that one down. Amanuensis is the person who uh, transcribes, who writes down as someone else is speaking. Uh, So Paul does not actually write down his own letters. Uh, He dictates and has a professional writer write down what he says. Uh, We we saw this in the the greetings at the the end of the book of of Romans uh, where Tertius, I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you. Well, Tertius wrote down the letter as Paul spoke to him. Uh, and so perhaps for these letters, uh, Paul had a different scribe. Uh, and one name that's been thrown out there is, is Luke. Uh, the idea with this theory would be uh, that Paul, uh, when he's writing some letters, uh, he may not have as much confidence in the person who's writing. So he speaks, and this guy writes down notes and shorthand. Uh, and then when Paul's done, he kind of fills it back out into a full letter uh, that Paul he then reads it back to Paul, and Paul can maybe, you know, say, well, that's not really what I was, how I meant that, and, and put it back into his own words uh, as this guy has written it down and, uh, you know, added some things to it, perhaps. Well, maybe for these letters, maybe Paul has an amanuensis that he really trusts, like somebody like Luke, who's, who says, you know, this guy is capable of writing my ideas. He's been around me so long uh, and so he, he gives him the, the, the draft, the, the verbal draft, and just says, you know, you, you fill this in. Uh, I trust you to do a good job. Uh, and, you know, he ends up filling up, you know, maybe just the word choice is a little different than what Paul would have used, but it, it ends up with the same ideas. Uh, so that's the idea here is, is perhaps uh, a different level of, of trust in his amanuensis, uh, the person writing the letter. Uh, 
I, I actually, I, this is one I would lean on more heavily maybe. Uh, these are letters that are written for private individuals, uh, whereas most of Paul's letters are written for reading in the church. Uh, he expects this to be someone where someone stands up in front of everybody and reads it out loud. Uh, and these letters to Timothy and Titus, uh, he maybe doesn't have that same sort of expectation for performance. Uh, and so that makes sense. We, we talk to uh, people differently that we're very close to uh, than how we might present to a, a larger group. Uh, and so there would be a, a difference in style uh, would be understandable there. Uh, these are also written later in life. I, I think we see Paul, you know, his emphases change over the course of his life. Uh, and uh, we, we've gone through these letters in what I think is the, the chrono chronological order. Uh, and, you know, he, things change about him. His, his ideas shift a little bit uh, and the things that he, he really uh, is talking about. The thing is, you know, I, I started coming to West Ark you know, 15 years ago, but then we went to Asia for the last 10 years. And I came back here, and I, I hate to tell you, some of you guys got a little bit older while we were gone. Uh, I don't know if you noticed that. Uh, and he, you know, to be honest with you, some of you guys not only got older, but also got a little grouchier uh, when we got back, uh, which I think maybe had something to do with getting older. Uh, so there is maybe a little bit of a, a grouchier tone in these letters. I don't know if that, you, you might uh, read through and disagree with that. Uh, but you know, if, if he's writing as an older person, uh, it would be possible that his style could change from a different perspective of age. Uh, and I would really, this is kind of my, maybe my main point, is good writers can show a stylistic range. And Paul is a good writer. Uh, and even the, the evidence for you know, wanting to exclude Ephesians and Colossians, I think is just pointing out Paul's range of writing ability. Uh, we would see that, you know, think about somebody like you know, C.S. Lewis. Uh, if you take a sampling of C.S. Lewis books, of you know, the Chronicles of Narnia and The Great Divorce and his science fiction about Mars, uh, the screw tape letters you know, written as a perspective of a demon writing letters to another demon, you say, well, those are really different styles. Uh, but he's a good writer, and he's able to pull that off. Uh, and here we have just a, a very relatively small sampling of letters, uh, com you know, especially compared to what a modern writer would write. Uh, I think a good writer can, can demonstrate a little bit of variety and still be the same person. Uh, so I, I think this is my main idea here is I think Paul's a good writer. He can write in different styles. Uh, besides the style, I, maybe just to, to emphasize the, the point about the genuineness here again. Uh, we read in these letters, there's lots of personal details. Uh, he mentions lots of names, uh, his travel plans to different places. I, I think it would be really hard for somebody just to, to come up with these ideas, these names, just invent people, and then you know, start having it read in church, and people's like, well, I, I've never heard of that person before. Uh, or maybe say, I, I know that person. Uh, I don't remember that about him. Uh, you can't just introduce people in places uh, out of thin air like that, I don't think. It makes more sense to say, well, he's, he mentions all these personal details because he actually knows these people in, in these places. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit later today, too, but uh, each letter hints at a different, slightly different situation. Uh, we, we can see the situation on Crete that Titus is dealing with is a little bit different than the situation Timothy's dealing with. Uh, we see Paul very subtly, he, he's giving them some of the same broad ideas, but he tailors each one to their situation a little bit differently. Uh, and it would be impressive, I think, for someone else to come back later and have that same uh, eye for detail on something that you were just creating on your own. Maybe another question is, you know, why would someone who's just writing this down, why would they choose to write it as three separate letters? If you have this idea of, like, of what you think Paul would say, uh, I think you would probably just write it as one letter rather than write it as three letters, two of which have a lot of the same material, 
uh, presented in slightly different ways. Uh, I don't know why uh, you would write it this way unless it was actually Paul writing to sort of three different situations. And besides Marcion, uh, who, as we mentioned, is kind of crazy, uh, there's no evidence that any Christians throughout history were suspicious of these. Uh, not until really the 20th century, uh, but in the early 2nd century, people are, are citing these books as though they recognize these are really letters from Paul. Uh, and you know, by the end of the 2nd century, they're actually attributing it to Paul very clearly. Which is, you know, we have other books where the early church was less sure about. Uh, they read stuff like, you know, the Gospel of Barnabas and uh, the Acts of Peter, and they said, I, I, I don't know about this. I, I really don't think this is Scripture. And they decided, you know, it's not Scripture. Uh, they even, you know, read the book of Revelation uh, and said, you know, this is a little bit weird. Uh, I'm not sure what this means. Is this really Scripture? Uh, also, it makes sense, you know, Revelation, we accept is written as at a later date uh, compared to the rest of the New Testament, where we've already got this, this corpus of, of stuff that we already, we already have been reading for 20, 30 years, and now this new book comes in that's a little weird. You can understand why people were skeptical, but they, in, in the end, they, they agree. Uh, this, this is a genuine letter. And so other books, we had this controversy. Uh, these, these three of Paul were never controversial. Uh, I think that's a pretty uh, strong statement about uh, people recognizing that these are from Paul, uh, that you couldn't just sneak in these letters and all of a sudden people just start reading them as though uh, you know, they, they just fit with everything else. Uh, but uh, so I guess I'll just say, I, I accept these as being from Paul, uh, which you know, probably you, you've i uh, been thinking the same way until I started uh, rambling about it for the last half hour. Uh, because they say they're from Paul, everything fits with them being from Paul. Uh, so, there's a, an answer to a question you never asked, uh, is that these are, I think, written by the Apostle Paul. Okay, now we're actually going to get into the, the first two of these, 1 Timothy and Titus. Uh, so, we said, you know, Paul has been in prison in Rome. Now, uh, I think he's released at the end of Acts uh, because he is moving again. He, he leaves Titus at Crete. Uh, he's been in, in northern Greece, in Macedonia, uh, where he sends Timothy to Ephesus. He's heard about some, some issues going on in the churches. And so he's, he's sending his delegates uh, to help the churches sort through these problems. Uh, maybe the question is, why... Did Paul go back to the east when his, his plan in Romans was to go west to Spain? Uh, and if, if he's released from prison, uh, instead of going to Spain, or maybe, you know, maybe after he goes to Spain, he's now working back in his, his uh, familiar territories again. Uh, but we can maybe save that for another time. Uh, let's talk about these, these two guys that Paul's writing to. The first one is Timothy. Uh, we met him on the second journey, uh, that he's from the city of Lystra in Galatia. Uh, he has a Jewish Christian mother and a Greek father, you know, maybe, maybe not even a Christian. Uh, Paul, Lystra is one of the first cities Paul and Barnabas visit on their journey, so maybe he meets, uh, Timothy meets Paul and Barnabas on that first trip when uh, his uh, mother becomes a Christian. Uh, but it's on the second journey that he actually joins up with Paul and Silas when they pass through Lystra. Uh, it's this time that Paul circumcises him uh, for reasons, uh, I, I don't think it's, it's related to any sort of uh, expectation that this is an you know, issue about salvation, uh, just that this is uh, something that, that's going to be helpful for Timothy's ministry. He, he's quite frequently credited as a co-author of Paul's letters, First and Second Thessalonians along with Silas, 2 Corinthians, uh, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, the most frequent collaborator with Paul on writing. Uh, Paul addresses him in these letters as a young man, uh, so if he's still young, 
now that Paul is getting old, uh, would have made him really young when he joined up with Paul in that second journey. Maybe, maybe just a teenager. Uh, and so, I don't know what he, you know, maybe he's in his 30s or so now and could still be considered young. Uh, there, the reference here to, you know, he has uh, bouts with sickness. Uh, I think that's just a normal thing if you're a, a traveler and especially in the, the first century. Uh, there's lots of diseases out there. Uh, he even gets mentioned in the book of Hebrews uh, that he had been in prison and released. Uh, and so uh, we haven't talked about Hebrews uh, because I don't think it's written by Paul, uh, but maybe that should be a topic for one of our, our last uh, couple weeks here is discussing did Paul write Hebrews since we've been talking about did Paul write these other letters. Uh, Titus, uh, whereas Timothy's got a, a Jewish mother and a Gentile father, uh, he's a full Gentile. Uh, and he is not circumcised. And, and Paul even discusses him in Galatians as this test case that he brings uh, to the apostles and say, here's this guy, he's a Christian, he's not circumcised, is that okay? And they say it's okay. Uh, he's been delivering some letters to Paul. He delivered one letter to Corinth that we don't have anymore. Uh, but he also delivered 2 Corinthians, uh, which has helped sorting out some of the issues that had come up between Paul and the church there. Uh, as mentioned in Titus, he's, he's now on Crete, uh, and mentioned later he goes to the, the region of Dalmatia. Uh, it's modern-day Croatia, Bosnia, Serbia, that, that area of, of southeastern Europe. Uh, and I think unusually, uh, he's not mentioned in the book of Acts, despite being uh, a pretty prominent figure in Paul's letters. Uh, he does not show up anywhere in that narrative, uh, which uh, is, is odd, but uh, I don't know what to do with. Uh, so Timothy is going to the city of Ephesus. Uh, it's a city that Paul knows well. Uh, he'd been there for over two years as sort of his, his base camp for uh, his fundraising tour. He set up a, a, a classroom there where he was teaching each day. Uh, we, we mentioned this, he has this tearful goodbye with the elders there. So, you know, it shows that he's got a, a strong connection with the church there. He's, he's written them a letter, the, the book of Ephesians. Uh, but, so, but despite this, this history with Paul, uh, some leaders in Ephesus have gotten away from the focus of the gospel. And that's why Paul is sending Timothy to the church to, to help correct these problems. Uh, Crete, you know, like I said, it's not a city. It's, this is an island. Uh, it's a place that has a, a bit of a, a reputation for rowdiness uh, and a little bit proud of their reputation, too. Uh, I, I think it's kind of, you know, some people talk about, you know, redneck jokes or you might be a redneck. It's sort of thing like you kind of wear as a, as a badge of honor if that applies to you, even though it uh, might be viewed as, by outsiders as uh, a, an insult. But for some people, you, you can you wear that proudly. I think that's, that's what the, the Cretans do. Uh, Paul cites uh, this saying about Cretans, uh, that one of Crete's own prophets has said it, Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gut gluttons. Uh, and the, the funny thing is, it's a Cretan who says this about his own people. Uh, it kind of gives you the idea that they, they don't really mind uh, that reputation. Uh, there's no mention in Acts that Paul was here starting a church. Uh, so maybe this is a, a younger, less mature church than what we have in Ephesus, but uh, seems to have the same issues going on, uh, perhaps you know, maybe not even as, as severely as in Ephesus. Uh, the, book, the book to Titus is only half as long as the book of 1 Timothy, uh, so he doesn't have to deal with this issue quite as much there. Uh, what's Paul responding to? Uh, the issue seems to be coming from Jewish Christians, Titus mentions those who are of the circumcision and from leaders who are, who are teaching this idea. Uh, it seems to, he mentions, you know, things about quarrels about the law, about Jewish myths, genealogies. Uh, there's this idea of, of strict self-denial against food and marriage. Uh, it's actually maybe a lot of overlap with what we've seen in, in the church in Colossae, where it's this, it's this Jewish element, but it's not this Jewish legalism so much as it is uh, this philosophical Judaism that, that focuses more on 
uh, asceticism, about uh, strict denial uh, here. Uh, so it seems to be going around at this time. Uh, and he wants to remind them, you know, the, the heart of the gospel uh, doesn't have to do with any of these, these issues they're talking about. So Paul's message to, to both of these places, uh, I think he hits four things uh, in, in each of these uh, letters. Uh, so point one, uh, he's trying to correct those who are leading the churches down the wrong track. Uh, they've got some leaders who are wasting their time on these useless dis- you know, debates and discussions. Uh, so first thing, we need to, to get them back on the right track. Part of doing that, I think, is appointing good elders and deacons. Uh, that it appears maybe some of the, the leaders, the elders of the church, uh, are the ones causing the problem. And so you, you put in some, some good men uh, who can help uh, balance that out. Uh, so both of these letters talk about uh, the, the qualifications for elders and deacons. He, he's writing to these, these two men about how to engage various groups. Uh, old people, young people, uh, men, women. So it's old men, young men, uh, old women, young women, masters and slaves. Uh, and this message about how Christians should behave in their communities. Uh, this, is, I think, is, a, is an interesting point, this last one. You know, it, early on in Paul's letters, uh, he is, is presenting this claim that Jesus is Lord, uh, which stands in this in sharp contrast to the claim of the day is Caesar is Lord. It uh, has this, this sort of uh, unpatriotic undertone to it uh, that Christians uh, do not uh, recognize uh, Caesar as their, their true leader, as their true master. Uh, Jesus Christ is their true leader. Well, that uh, maybe is a good message for a small uh, very minority church. Uh, but now the church is getting larger, and I think people are starting to, to question, like, you know, what are these Christians about? Are they, are they unpatriotic? Uh, are they really good people? Uh, and I think Paul wants to, to make sure people recognize you as good people, uh, even though you have this claim uh, that you are following not their gods, not their Caesar, uh, but you're following Jesus. So notice how this plays into to various places uh, in the book. Uh, when he's talking to the women in, in Crete, uh, he says, likewise, t- teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. I told you this, Cretans are a, a little rowdy, so the old women uh, have a drinking problem. Uh, the, the Cretan quilting group is, is actually... Uh, you know, knocking back a few drinks while they're quilting, I guess. Uh, that's just how it is there, I guess. Uh, they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, to be subject to their husbands. And what's the reason for all this? So that no one will malign the Word of God. Uh, the, the reason you do these things is to present yourself well to others uh, so they don't speak badly uh, have a bad impression of the gospel. Uh, and for young men, uh, you know, I won't read there, but notice the, the reasoning here, so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about it. So the reason you live an upright life is to show the people around you, they, they, they don't have any uh, complaints, any reason for complaint about you, uh, that what you're doing is right. Uh, when you're t- he's talking to slaves and masters, uh, so talking to, to slaves, uh, you know, don't steal from your masters so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. So for every group, th- this justification is think about how people are going to view you uh, and put, uh, you're trying to, to show people the positive, the, the, the changed uh, life of a Christian is a positive thing. Uh, Timothy has the same thing for slaves, uh, so that God's name and our teaching may not be slandered. Uh, we, we are maybe familiar with the, the passage about being subject to rulers and authorities. So Titus mentions this, uh, you know, to obey your leaders and 
First Timothy mentions it as well, to, to pray for kings and all those in authority that we may live peaceful and quiet lives. I think this is all tied into the same idea. Like, is Christians want to be a positive part of their communities. Uh, and it's, it's time where, as Christians, the Christian population is getting bigger, people are getting suspicious of who these Christians are. We want to show them uh, they do not have reason to be suspicious of them. They don't have reason to hate us. Uh, we are doing good things. Uh, we're li living peaceful, quiet lives. Uh, we're not troublemakers. So we see this over and over uh, in these letters, uh, this message about thinking about how the community uh, views Christians. All right, last thing. This, is, this will be a good one because we won't have enough time to do it, uh, so I can just kind of throw it out there and you can uh, deal with it or talk to me later. Uh, do we follow Scripture? Uh, because we, we have, a, I think, a point of pride for us is that we are, we are big about following the commands of Scripture. Uh, that we, we not only, only follow the commands, uh, we make sure that we don't do the things that are not commanded. Uh, and even things, uh, not, once we get all the commands taken care of, then it's well, anything that we even see an example of in, script, in the New Testament, uh, we also want to do that. Uh, so we, we're going beyond just the things that are commanded. Uh, we're also following the examples of the New Testament church. Well, let me show you this in 1 Timothy the widow list. Have you ever heard a sermon on the widow list? Uh, have you ever heard a preacher talk about this? Because this is a pretty detailed uh, instruction, a uh, set of instructions from Paul, uh, that he tells uh, Timothy that the church in Ephesus needs to set up a list of widows that the church will support. And he gives very clear criteria uh, for who is on the list. Uh, so they, they need to be above 60, a younger widow maybe can still support herself uh, through a job. Uh, people who get support shouldn't have children or grandchildren. Once again, uh, those, those cases you'd expect the children to be caring for the, the widow. And she needs to be uh, you know, a good character, faithful to her husband, known for her good deeds. Uh, so we have a, a very detailed uh, set of instructions here. And maybe, maybe since I'm not a widow, I, I haven't been aware that this has been going on all along. Uh, but I've never heard this in churches, that uh, we, we maintain a list of people who uh, are eligible for church support, uh, which I think it's a pretty clear command here. Uh, but actually, you, you read through all First Timothy, and you're going to find all sorts of stuff uh, that I think, you know, strictly speaking, we, we probably don't do these things. Uh, so uh, Paul says he, he wants men to, to lift their hands when they pray. Uh, which is, I, I think, not uh, a common thing. Uh, he tells women not to braid their hair. Uh, once again, a clear instruction, no pearl jewelry for women. Uh, not, a, not a command, but example of laying on of hands. Uh, maybe we've done that some. I've seen that a little bit. Uh, he tells Timothy to, to drink a little wine. And like I said, this list of, of qualifying widows. Uh, now, I'm sure we can find some reason to, to exclude all of these things, to say, well, that was, that was just cultural, uh, but you have to be careful with that argument because that's what lots of people are, would use uh, to throw out the things that you think are important. Uh, and they say, well, that was just, Paul was just cultural there. Uh, so I think this is an issue where we have this idea that we are, uh, we have this easy to follow rubric of following the commands of Scripture. Uh, and I don't think it's maybe as, as clear cut as that. We maybe need to, to reflect on that a little bit more of, of how we do apply Scripture in our lives. Uh, well, uh, we could talk about elders and deacons. I better save that. Uh, talk about women saved through childbirth. Uh, we're going to have to skip that one too. You, you have to figure that one out on your own. Uh, next week we'll talk about the letter to 2 Timothy, and we'll talk about uh, some speculation about the end of Paul's life uh, and what we, know, we don't have much to go on from Scripture, but we, we have some historical evidence for that. Let, let's close this morning uh, with this, this prayer of praise uh, that we find in First Timothy. There's actually a, a couple good ones, uh, I think, in First Timothy. Uh, but 
this, this praise of God. God, the Father and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, who no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Thank you for your attention this morning. I hope to see you next week as we get into 2 Timothy.